All right. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us here at uh, Melchizedek uh, Covenant Calendar, where we uh, study the word uh, together, and uh, we are the word that transforms us, and we uh, um, are here blessed to have you all so you can be edified by the teachings that Yahuwah has put in our spirits and minds so we may be able to share with others and bring um, understanding and wisdom to all of you. Uh, and I wanted to say Shabbat Shalom to everyone and hear from the congregation uh, from Torah to the tribes. So everybody, you can say Shabbat Shalom, blow your shofar. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, the irony, the watchman can't blow the shofar, but the wife of the watchman can. There you go. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. All right, excellent. Well, um, well, today's uh, teaching um, will be regarding the Tekufa. The Tekufa is the day that is, uh, determines when the year ends and also allows us to understand that since the year ends on that day, the next day is the first day of the year in a, a biblical calendar. And also, uh, that's the first part of the teaching. The second part will be about uh, the prof the uh, prophets um, of old and um, how they connect with uh, the revelation. So, and Brandon is going to be uh, give us a uh, teaching an overview of that, uh, which he will expound more on it next week. Uh, thank you all uh, for all being here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, the um, Tekufa teaching. But before I do, I see Gabriella has her hand up. So go ahead, sister. Hello? Hello? Sorry. Um, <laughs> I just didn't get the technique, the practical stuff with my smile. It does, didn't mean anything. I'm just listening. <laughs> Did oh, you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you, I thought you raised your hand. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, one thing I'm going to suggest, you guys, is when someone's speaking it seems like you know we're really dealing with the pranks of the power of the air this morning um so uh when someone is speaking um i would just do a hide video um for everybody else uh that way the bandwidth will go to the person that is uh is talking in their video uh that way it doesn't be so it won't be so chop choppy so just a just a suggestion especially when we get into like comments and and questions and stuff like that okay yeah that's that's a good idea especially during the video because um it, it will definitely help to distribute the bandwidth more i appreciate you saying that and you all I, and just so you know you if during the presentation if you all want to chat please feel free but do try to keep it to a minimal while the presentation is on only because there's a lot of pinging noise in the background when that happens which i have no problem with it but i you know just out of uh, consideration for other presenters um but anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, and get started on this. But if you all have any questions afterwards, please feel free to raise your hand, and uh, and we'll do that in orderly fashion. Um, all right. So I hope you all are edified by this. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so the teaching is um, about when does the biblical year start? Um, and um, what, you know, what is necessary to determine um, this day and uh, what scriptural references do we have um, to be able to support when the year starts? And uh, also, how can we determine or how can we uh, put this to the test ourselves here today uh, as a, um, uh, you know, as a yearly application um, to know when the year starts. So we're going to cover those things. And um, 
and more. All right, so um, now the year begins the day after the spring equinox, also known as the Takufa. There is no shadow of turning on this day. Now let us start to investigate the meaning of what a year is and how it connects with the sun and the Kufa. Now the Takufa is the spring or the autumn equinox. Now this uh, first time the word year is mentioned in the Bible was in Genesis 1:14, when it read, then Elohim said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate from the night. Let them be a mark for seasons, the days and the years. Now the word year in Hebrew is pronounced shane, and it is a literal, in its literal sense, according to Jesenius Hebrew Shaldi lexicon, this word means the repetition of the course of the sun. The root of the Hebrew word shane is shana, which is defined to repeat, to do again, to do a second time. Now the word year in Latin is pronounced anus, which means an indication of a circle. Now this gives us a really good indication of the sun that is re re revolving in a circular motion that covers a 360 degree area or circumference, and it does it in 360 day cycle. It's amazing how Yahuwah, <laughs> you know, makes uh, things so perfectly that even today through ge geometry, we're able to uh, see through even math of his uh, perfect creation. Now, how wonderful is Yahuwah and how he loves his children, how he painted the sky in a perfect circle. Now, Ecclesiastes 1.5, the sun rises and the sun sets. Then it presses on to the same place where it rises. Now this is a good witness to show that the sun wants to go to its own original place. Uh, meaning, after 365 days now, but back then 360, it presses in to go back to its original place. And that's when uh, the Takufa happens. Now the sun was the greater light mentioned in Genesis 14.6 that completed a 360 day cycle in a year's time that maintained a constant and exact repetition year by year regarding its point of origin and cyclical position. I see no connection that the word Shane or Shana, which is the etymology, it is actually the root word of Shane, is related to any other heavenly body other than the sun. Now this verse is evidence, uh, this next verse is evidence to let us know how many months are in a 360 day year. If we read Revelations 22.2, it reads, one, uh, I'm sorry, on either side of the river grew the tree of life that produces fruits 12 times a year, Shane, once a year, I'm sorry, uh, once each month, the leaves of the trees, yes, is your screen supposed to be sharing? All I'm seeing is uh, you're just saying you're starting to share your screen. I don't know if anybody else is seeing that, or am I just the only one seeing that? No, I can see his screen. Yeah, oh, my, my screen. Just, it must be stuck. I guess or it might just be my, my Zoom then. Okay, never mind, brother. I'll just okay. No, that's fine. Uh, just, to, just to verify, are you all seeing the screen with the sun picture in it? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Perfect. Yes. All right, I'm, great, great. I might log off and come back on and see if it'll fix it. Okay, brother. So, um, go back just a little bit. So, this next verse is evidence to let us know how many months there are in a 360-day year. Uh, Revelation 22.2 reads, On either side of the river grew the tree of life that produces fruit 12 times a year, Shane. Once each month, the leaves of the trees serve as medicine for the nations. Now, the sun completed a 360-day year cycle, uh, which was created to cover a 360-degree span over one year. 
So this means that the 30-day month um, would fit perfectly into a 12-month um, 12, 12, uh, year. So it is um, um, derivative to 12 months, the 360 days, which is just good. And not, not a 29.5 month does not fit in a 360 day, uh, you know, uh, year. And I think Conroy did a, an amazing job uh, explaining that through scripture, how that is uh, the case. Um, only a 30 day month can fit in a 360 day year. Uh, and so also we see through Daniel and Revelation that that is also the case. Um, which is future events are going to be happening. So we see that there will be a restoration to the calendar as well and to the 12 tribes. Now, um, on this next um, slide here, uh, we'll share the additional witnesses that establish the truth of a matter. Now, on Genesis 1.14 uh, and 16, the, uh, then Elohim said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night, let them mark the seasons. The days and the years, Shanae, plural, because we're talking about more than one year, years, Shanae, Elohim made the two great lights, the greater one to govern the day, the sun, and the lesser um, one to govern the night and the stars. Now the sun was created or established in, on Genesis 1:14, when Yahuwah said, let there be lights in the domes on the sky. Now, is it, this is actually a question. Um, you know, was the sun created or was it established on Genesis 1.14? You know, it took me a while to actually understand this because, you know, this is your near jerk reaction to think, well, it must have been created on, on the uh, fourth day. But we're going to find out further evidence that that just was not the case. Now, the word create is mentioned in the first verse in Genesis 1, when it reads, in the beginning Elohim created, the word created here is in Hebrew pronounced bara, which means to birth, to birth out, the heavens and the earth. The word is not seen uh, being used until the creation of the whales and every living creature that moved on the fifth day. So on the fourth day, when the sun was seen as the greater light to rule the day, that wasn't so much the day in which it was created, but the day that it was established. The sun was actually created based on the literal meaning of the word, bara, during the first words mentioned in the beginning of the chapter. In the beginning, when Elohim created bara, the heavens and the earth, and not in verse 14, when Yahuwah said, let there be lights, meant that Yahuwah established the lights to rule the day and night, uh, that, uh, not that he created them on the fourth day. Now, these are um, additional witnesses that reveal the purpose of the sun and what it was designed for. Now, the sun um, has been described as the greater light through the scriptures. For example, um, you're going to see in these examples how you're going to be able to connect these following witnesses with the Genesis account. According, um, as we can see on, on uh, Psalms 136.8, the sun to rule the day, or to govern the day, for his mercy endures forever. In Jeremiah 31.35, thus says Yahuwah, who gives the sun to light the day. Again, another witness that the sun is what the Genesis 14 was about. Isaiah 60, 19. The sun shall be no more uh, the light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light into thee. Now, this study um, has explained through scriptural evidence and word research and the etymology of the words that the sun without a doubt, has been the source that determines the year's length. Now, when does the year begin? The biblical year commences on the day after the Takufa, or better known today as the spring equinox. And after that, 
it runs its 365.25 day cycle or 365 and a quarter days. But this wasn't always the case because as times have changed, so have the duration of years. Uh, there, were, um, there was a time when the year was actually only 360 days. This covenant calendar in session commenced on the first day when Yahuwah spoke it out, let there be light, until the prayer was answered as King Hezekiah's life was extended and the shadow was turned back 10 steps or 10 steps back or 10 degrees, right? Now, um, the vernal equinox happens on around, on or around March 20th. Uh, this year, the, the, uh, it actually uh, happened on the, on the, yeah, on the 19th. Uh, so the first day of the month was the 20th. Uh, it's the first day of a B, the first day of the first month. Yeah, it was on the 20th. So as the winter season ends and the spring season begins and commences the month of Abib when the crops turn green. Okay? Even though we can detect a takufa anywhere on the earth, it is at the northern hemisphere where the day after the equinox is considered the first day of the year and the beginning of springtime. Now, the shadow of no turning will give us a good indication of when the year ends. Uh, there are some elements that can help us determine when the equinox happens. Although the sun's light is an important natural element to help determine when the year ends, there are still other natural elements that are needed to help us measure the vernal equinox, which is approximately around March 20th. The Earth is an important element that is used as a flat plane to, de to detect any variation of the shadow or no shadow. The shadow that is caused by the obstruction of an object is a measurement that is of utmost importance. Now the necessary light is an indicator letting us know when the sun is revolving different times of the year. Uh, like this picture illustrates, uh, we see that there's a shadow um, <clears throat> uh, uh, being cast as, as a result of the obstruction being caused by the stick from the light. So uh, different times of the year, that, that shadow can change according to where the sun is positioned. And um, as, as those who have measured or understand a little bit more about how to measure a tekufa, well, there would be no shadow over that stick, at least if it's in a straight line down. So uh, when the sun is above um, the stick, or um, there would be no shadow. But that only would happen during a takufa because the sun would be perfectly aligned going from east to west. Now, um, this, okay, this is the one day of the year when there is no shadow of turning, meaning there is no arc on the shadow formed by the sun's light. And it declares when the year ends. James 1.17 read, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with, with, uh, with whom there is no variation of shadow of turning. Now, the word turning here in uh, James 1.17, above in Greek, means revolution, figuratively speaking, or in a variation. The shadow during an equinox does not turn um, nor vary as the sun's revolution restarts at the same place it once begun in a cycle of 365.25 days. The shadow of no turning can be measured using different methods, but one that is commonly used can be accomplished by watching the shadow for a period of time by inserting a vertical object in a horizontal level plane, uh, like you know the one we saw in the back picture, and keep watch until the shadow eventually disappears while the sun casts its light right above the object. Now, <clears throat> below one can see how the other tools can be used uh, to measure the shadow of no turning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this, what you see here in this picture, okay, it's a cylinder. Now, this uh, is a way of measurement that illustrates that during an equinox, there is no shadow being cast in any direction other 
then the downward shape of the cylinder. As the sun is casting its light at midday directly over the carton cylinder. Now, this is a good way for you to experiment on your own, uh, as other prophecies of Daniel and Revelations are quickly drawn near. I recommend to, uh, for you to fasten your seatbelts and record this tekufas that can be observed anywhere in the earth. Now, another instrument you can use is placing a stick on the ground and see if there is a shadow being cast in any direction during this day. If you do um, want to do it on your own, just be sure to start measuring the shadow, I would say about you know, a few days before the tekufa is uh, most likely gonna be expected. I would say at least five days, <laughs> only because we wanna make sure that if Yahuwah changes uh, the 365, you know, um, back to 360, you don't want to start looking for the Takufa, you know, let's say after the Takufa happened. So you don't want to wait. So I would probably start, like if we're looking um, around the 19th or 20th, you want to start measuring the shadow around the 13th. That actually would not be a bad idea because it gives you an extra couple of extra days, maybe, um, you know, to, to play with, but that would be a good time. And you, and even if it doesn't start that year, you can still see and start marking the, the, uh, the natural course of the sun, and you'll get more of an idea visually of um, how that shadow of no turning will eventually be accomplished by the rotation of the sun or the circle of the sun that ends up going to the same place. Um, now, um, the, this next slide here, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and continue with the tekufa. Um, explain. Now, the Hebrew word tekufa, H8622, in the Gesenius lexicon means end of a year and can also declare the end of the agricultural season, which happens in autumn, in about the date of September 23rd. And this is when it, we celebrate the Feast of Trumpets. Now the Tekufa is the event that identifies the actual equinox and the positioning of the sun in the Maseroth, also known as the 12 constellations. Now uh, there are several places throughout scripture where the word Tekufa is mentioned identifying the vernal equinox and autumn equinox as seen uh, below using the Young's literal translation. Uh, sometimes I like to use this translation because it does take some of the grammar out and just focuses on the actual word being used. Okay. Now on Exodus 34, 22, it reads, and a feast of weeks, um, and a feast of week, thou dost observe for thyself first fruits of, wheat, of a wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the revolution, meaning Tekufa, of the year, Shane. Again, you see those two words together, as they, they should be, <laughs> because the Tekufa, meaning the revolution or the end, is um, when the sun itself uh, completes its revolution. Now, other translations read, uh, like in the scriptures uh, translations, at the turn of the year, again, we got tekufa, meaning turn, and year shene. And then a King James Version, at the year's end. Again, those two, those two words are uh, together again. Now, the revel, uh, uh, this is relevant to how the word tekufa is connected to the year's end. Um, if I were to just read the Hebrew definition Using the word tekufa and shane, it would read the end of the course of the sun. So if I just take the shane, the, the word year, out and the, and the word end, I mean, and the word, um, I'm sorry, um, shane, basically if I just use the definition, the, the, it would read the end of the course of the sun. Uh, that would be um, if I were just to use the definitions of these two words. So that's very telling right there, uh, what the purpose of the sun is. Now, um, the equinox, or basically revolution of the year, that is in this verse that we just read on Exodus 34, 22, 
is marking the second takufa, which indicates the autumn equinox. Now this is when the end of the agricultural season ends and night season begins to get longer and the light season shortens. According to the Gesenius lexicon, the word year, Shane, can also refer to repetition of the changes of seasons as spring, summer, and autumn, and winter. Now this, uh, this, is, uh, this an autumn equinox that ends the summer and the sun crosses over the equator heading southward. Now, um, another um, verse where we can see the word tekufa take place is in 1 Samuel 1, 20 through 21. And it comes to pass that at revolution of the year, tekufa, that Hannah conceived and beareth a son and calleth his name Samuel. For from Yahuwah I have asked him, and the man Elakana goes up, and all his house, the sacrifice to Yahuwah, the sacrifice of the days, uh, he, and uh, his vow. Now, within the context of this verse, there was a yearly slaughter mentioned on verse 21, indicating that Hannah gave birth to Samuel right before Passover, during the vernal equinox, or in this case, revolution of days. Another uh, witness we have here where the Tekufa is mentioned, and just so you know, Tekufa is actually mentioned four times throughout the scriptures. Um, and so what we're doing, we're just breaking down the context of Tekufa and how it relates with the year, with the sun. Now at the, um, and it comes to pass at this turn, which Tekufa of the year, comes up, has the force of Aram against him, and they come into Je uh, Judah or Jehuda and Jerusalem and destroys all the heads of the people from the people and all their spoil they have sent to the king of Damascus and that is in 2nd Chronicles 24 23 now this is another scriptural evidence that can be seen as compounding the word Tekufa and Shane within the same context now this other witness is in Psalms 19.4 through 6. And I just added a little bit more uh, in the context here because I do want to cover um, a couple of things about this uh, verse as well and how this relates to uh, the coming of our king. Now, Psalms 19.4 through 6 reads, Into all the earth has their line gone forth, and to the end of the world their sayings. For the sun hath he placed a tent in them, and he, as a bridegroom, goes out from his covering. He rejoices as the mighty one to run the path. From the ends of the heaven, he is going out. And his revolution, Tekufa, is into the end. And nothing is hid from his heat, you know, indicating the sun, right? Now, uh, through the expanses of the uh, firmament, the sun is clearly seen and makes a revolution from one end of the heavens to the other end where nothing will escape is heat. Now the course of the sun is very important as it also represents the course of the bridegroom, which we know is Yahusha. And we see that we will be leaving, I mean, he will be leaving the tent, heaven, which is placed where he is getting ready before coming to get his bride. Okay, so it's a good time for us to be ready. <laughs> For him, because he is going to leave the tent, um, so um, so we must be ready for for him. Um, just waiting for us, right? Another thing is um, about this verse, I, and a, a sister brought it up last night, and uh, and I wanted to share that the um, the word allegorically is used. You know, the word sun, shane, uh, use also. Um, to describe, you know, the son of man, as we can see in Malachi, this the son um, coming with healing, with uh, healing under his wings. Uh, we also see in John, you know, we have his allegorical um, used uh, to represent the, the 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 light of the world, the larger light and the and the lesser light. That I 
that I, I, I can see uh, as, a, as a position of a priesthood, there is a greater light that is, that is from heaven and there's a lesser light that is a kind of a shadow into the, um, well, into the like ironic priesthood. Uh, also, um, John describes his, his face and, uh, uh, and also uh, Peter, when they had the vision that the, his, his face is as bright as the sun. So there's a lot of um, um, things that we can uh, see um, that um, are, are quite uh, evident that Yahusha, um, his glory is represented by light. So that's, uh, that's a very um, important thing. And the first thing that Yahuwah said in the beginning, let there be light, you know, introducing Yahusha into all existence. So that's, that's a, a wonderful thing as well because he is the visible Yahuwah. Okay. Now, according to Exodus 12.2, Yahuwah told Moshe, that this month should be the beginning of months, the first month of the year. Uh, he also tells them that on the 14th day of the same month, there will be, there will, uh, they were to celebrate Passover. Therefore, we know that the first day of the year and Passover are in the same month, and that will be the month of Abib, the first month of the year. Now, Yahuwah said to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will stand at the head of your calendar. You will recon it the first month of the year. This day on which you are going out is in the month of Abib, according to Exodus 12, 1 through 2 and 13, 4. Now, these verses indicate that the beginning of the year commences with the month Abib, which means the month of ripe grain or ear of grain that points to the spring season of the year. The commencement of the month of Abib is the day after the vernal equinox. Now, the equinox was also observed by the Egyptians, um, as uh, well as many other ancient civilizations, as recorded through historical textbooks and archaeology to determine when the year started. Now, in past times, the Sphinx head near the Pyramid of Giza was constructed uh, facing uh, the sun east so that at the time of the equinox, the sun would rise directly above the head and as seen in the illustration. Um, so it's amazing how the Egyptians, you know, uh, knew, their, knew the position of the stars and the moon and the sun and everything. They truly were experts at it, for sure. Um, and now, uh, now the pyramids were designed in such a way that the sun's light used to reflect off the white limestone that once covered them in order to know when the equinox was going to start. Now, the scriptures declare that Moshe was educated by the way of the Egyptians in Acts, you know, 7.22. So it's safe to say that Yahuwah gave him this knowledge and wisdom so Moshe could keep track of the days and years in accordance to his covenant calendar, which was ratified at Mount Sinai. Now, if you look at this picture here, okay, we see a, it looks at first glance, a four-sided pyramid. But it actually, it's not. It's actually eight-sided with uh, and configured extremely accurate uh, for one side to actually point to the true north, which is, a, which is um, the true north is the north star. And it's only off by like 0 0.003 degrees. I mean, it's something like, I, I mean, these people were like just engineers that are just amazing. I don't think that even today. Uh, I think even today this would be a very difficult feat to be able to get something like this going. But um, as far as the, um, the, if you can see here, there's a concave here and here and here, and you, you can barely see one, but there's one here. These pyramids were set up uh, in such a way that um, in the, in, in, during the equinox, one part here, one quarter of, uh, or one eighth of this pyramid would light up and the other side would be dark, almost like introducing a new year from the old that is dark into a new one, which is light, which is quite interesting how, how um, it's all, um, uh, you know, describing the natural. And as you can see here, here are three smaller pyramids. Now, when the sun shines from this direction, 
it also gives them an, an indication of which season it is. So it was per, they are perfectly positioned because once this cattle is, sh is uh, casted into the side here, uh, you, they will also know which seasons uh, they were. So these are very important uh, things to understand as witnesses from the past, because there were actually about three over, I think there were 30 at least confirmed um, civilizations that actually used a 360 day calendar. Uh, and many of course, you know, as we see, um, you know, use the light. I mean, we see King, uh, you know, during King Hezekiah, the, 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 the shadows were measured by the steps, right? So there were other measuring wa the ways that people measured uh, the, the years and the times. So uh, there are different ways, but shadows are, uh, were something that were pretty important uh, to be able to measure the times. Um, you know, as a timepiece, you know, you had the sundial and things like that, that, that of course were, were pretty popular then. But uh, one of the things is that um, very evident is that, you know, um, when, the, when the shadow was, was turned back 10 steps, uh, that, was, um, that was the device they used to be able to know the days and the times. So, um, well, I hope you all enjoyed this presentation and this is, this will be the last uh, slide. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free. Good job, brother Jose. Appreciate that, sir. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. No problem, no problem. Anytime. Yes, brother Conrad, go ahead. Okay, Jose, that was spirit led. Seriously. <laughs> I have everything written down. And uh, definitely. You have answered Carol's question or problem that she had about two weeks ago, in which we said that we are going to answer her question. And you did. If she is here, or perhaps she may review this slide. So you have in maybe 16 power slides gave a representation of the Tikufa. If there is no ear, there is no Tikufa. And if there is no Tikufa, there is no ear. It's intertwined. So even though it may not be mentioned in those four occurrences in the KJV, you see that the Tikufa is hidden there with the ear. It's the same. So not because it's not there doesn't mean that it is not. If one do further research and study, you will see Tekufa, which is a circle, and the ear makes a circle. They are one and the same. So that needs to be understood because unfortunately, it has been replaced by the moon. And uh, next week, I will be discussing this much more, and also from a geodetic point of view, not from a heliocentric point of view that I see in nature with the Tukufa. Uh, two more things. People, those who have known about the Karaites, there are a sect in modern Judaism that uses a barley crop to begin the Tekufa, which is, <laughs> and so they use a moon closest to a barley to begin the year and to begin the month, not knowing that heavenly signs triumphed earthly signs. And they are saying, well, again, the vernal equinox is, man, is not mentioned. Moses did not put down the vernal equinox. Well, he put down the ear, and right there, you have the tikufa with the ear. So it's there, but it's hidden, and you have to dig deeper. Okay, so forget about the um, car rights, okay? But 
we need a body crop because it's an evidence that the ear or the, the beginning of the ear is, is, is near or somewhere around there. Okay? Heavenly signs triumph earthly signs. But we need earthly signs as another weakness as well. Oh, enough for the cards. Then we have to look one more thing about this um, equinox and the five days. We're going to have to look at the solstices. <laughs> and that is going to come up again. Because when right now presently, from the vernal equinox, when the sun goes north, presently, it travels perhaps 94 days. 94 days, sometimes 93. And it stops. Ha. Now, that is another sign to watch for. Because then, <laughs> it's going to help you determine when it comes back south to the autumn equinox, that could be 93 days. So, that will be discussed to find out where this five days, where he, the creator, is going to shorten the days. So, be, can be aware of this 1260 days commencement when the woman is fleeing to the desert for three and a half years is prophetic and is literal. So I'm going to leave it right there and hopefully the Father give us the strength. We can meet together, discuss it, and then present it on a power slide so that the believers here who are called would see how the Creator does things in nature. And Daniel 2.21, he says that Daniel says that he changes the times and seasons. And, Daniel's, and then when you always have the counterfeit, there is always a counterfeit. And you have the anti mashiach he changes the times and the laws. So there is always a counterfeit to what the Creator says, always. One more thing before I finish. If the Creator says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Men says, no, the soul that sinneth, it shall live, because the soul is immortal. The Creator says, the soul or being that sins will surely die. But men turn around and says, the soul that sinneth, it shall live. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Amen, amen, brother. Love, Love your bro. passion always. <laughs> um, we actually had a question, uh, and hopefully I pronounce her name right. Is it Xenia? I think that's how you say it. Um, and either you or uh, Brother Conrad, I know, can answer it. But she said, um, can someone explain to me the 30 days a month using Noah's Ark for me to get a clear picture? Because I've heard the opposing argument to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, Conrad did a teaching on this um, yeah. last week. So, um, Conrad, uh, can you please answer that? And by the way, before you do, I do agree. And I think, and I think Yao has, has definitely um, instilled in, you know, through Scripture and the Spirit that, you know, the exodus is going to overlap, you know. So yeah. there's going to be, we're, our exodus is going to be during, uh, very close to the Tekufa. And it's going to be very, you know, uh, right, right at the uh, Passover. So uh, it is, it is a blessing. Uh, and Linda, I said, I saw that your hand up early, uh, earlier as well. So uh, we'll get to you in just a moment. All right, sister. Uh, but uh, yeah, please, can you please answer that, Conrad? Because um, you, um, you just did a teaching on that just last week. Okay, simple. Like A, B, C, one, two, three. That's all. Well, I disagree, as <laughs> girls can be. No. It's simple. Five 30-day months equals 150 days. From 150 days, you can produce five 30-day months. You use any lunar 
calendar construction, whether you want to use a conjunction phase, or full moon phase, or crescent phase, your synodic month, according to science, okay, is 29.5 days. Multiply that by five, you have 147.5 days. I don't know where you get this 0.5 from anyway. Anyway, 147.5, you are short of two and a half days. And for you to have a month, listen, folks, you must have 30 consecutive dawn lights. You must begin with that to produce a 30-day month. It cannot be 30 consecutive moon lights. You do not see that in nature. It doesn't happen. Do not make the creator into infinite buffoonery. Seriously, I know that. You do not do that. You're insulting the creator of the universe when you do that, period. And he doesn't like it. And he got to stop. And it will be eventually. So here is it. You cannot do that. It must be 30 consecutive dawn lights that begins a month. Not no moonlight, and the moon is not in the equation, period. And that's the answer to that. Yeah, and uh, Xenia also put a couple of scripture references, but um, you can go back, uh, like Jose said, and watch uh, uh, Conrad's portion of last week because he referenced them there. But two I found just kind of off the cuff were Genesis 7.24 and um, Genesis 8.3. Uh, that definitely reference both two witnesses of 150 days. So, um, you know, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, and yeah, Zinian. So, yeah, we appreciate we appreciate the question um, for sure. And also, we're going to be going into this as we get just kind of a kind of a, a teaser, if you will, and then we'll get to Linda's question. Uh, appreciate your patience, Miss Linda, but. Um, as we get into, <clears throat> excuse me, as we get into, um, and as Brother Matthew gets into Revelation 12, we're actually going to, uh, we're going to draw out, um, you know, the fallacies within the lunar calendar even more. And also we're going to get into the, the pagan worship that comes from it as well. Um, so we're going to, we're going to go all into this and really just bring it all out, you know, Baal, Ashtaroth. Ishtar, all of it. So we're going to bring it all out. All right. So uh, absolutely. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yes, Linda, go ahead. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> I, I didn't recognize it last night, but um, in, I took ballet for many years and the word Shanae actually is the name for a move that is a 360 circle when you're spinning. So I thought that was really interesting and I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> because it's funny, once I started learning a lot about the Hebrew, I started recognizing it in other languages as they're, you know, because all of the moves are in French. So yeah, anyway, yeah. that, that was it. <laughs> interesting. And also, Chene Shine, you know how, you know, so there's, there's a lot of um, things that we, from that language, we, we see being built, being built from the original Hebrew, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, so great. Yeah, that's a good observation. Thanks for sharing that. Um, all right. So, um, Brandon, um, if you want to go ahead and get started, unless somebody else has a question or a comment. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely need to keep this rolling for sure. Um, so what we're going to do next is um, is we're actually, and it's so, I, I love how the Ruach works uh, between, uh, you know, Brother Jose, myself, Johnny, and uh, and Brother Conrad, um, because uh, I didn't even know what, what Jose was really going to talk about. I didn't even know he was going to mention Passover or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is actually play a clip, a 15-minute clip of, Brother Matthew's teaching from Revelation 6b, 
um, where he was talking about how Yahusha is the is the white rider uh, or the, is the is by the spirit is the horse on the white rider, <laughs> the rider on the white horse. Oh man, y'all pray for me. Um, but uh, anyway, it's just a beautiful correlation of how everything works. And um, so I'm gonna play that, and then um, and then uh, you know we'll have a brief time of uh, you know possible discussion after that, and then I'll get into uh, my teaching as well. Okay. Yes, Johnny, I need more coffee too. I've already had three cups though. <laughs> so um, we'll get into that. So let me, uh, let me share my screen here. There, share, audio. And I would encourage you if you haven't, gone and watch this, I would go back and watch it because uh, obviously you won't get the full context of what he's talking about, but it's relevant to what we're talking about. Which Yahweh gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which shortly must come to pass. This isn't supposed to be complicated to us. It's only complicated when we are stuck in the muddy tire tracks of our minds. But when you just say, hang on a minute, what does the Bible say? Why do I, why have I believed the lie? What has been presented to me, but what does the scripture present to me? Is this something that was prophesied through the psalmists, through the prophets, from the mountain all the way forward? Is this thematically Malkitzedic in origin? Is this confirmed by the writers of the Bible? This is the revelation, I believe, that is being shown to us. Think about Passover, back in the book of Shemot, Exodus. A time of judgment comes. Ten plagues come. Finally, the last rider is the death of the firstborn and with the last rider those enter into the house and find safety from the severest of judgments the first now we find the first shall be last but here we find the last shall be first it's the same Passover. Come into the house as the lamb brings forth the first seal. And if you don't, outside of the house is the greatest of judgments that this world has ever seen. Greater than the tenth plague of Egypt. This world will be hit with ten plagues all at once. Once those that reject the first seal find themselves boxed in between the second and the fourth. Because death will be everywhere. But it's not for those who come in under the Passover lamb. It's always been about the lamb. It's always the lamb. It always will be the lamb. It is the lamb, the lamb, the lamb of Yahuwah. Always. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's the first and the last in the Passover plan of Yahuwah. First Peter chapter 1 verse 13. Wherefore you better gird up the loins of your mind. You had better be sober and hope the end for the grace that which is brought unto you at the revelation of Yahusha. This first seal is grace that is being offered to you by the revelation of the ready writer that rides out as a king anointed as Messiah to make judgment over his enemies. This is the final option. There is no others. There is no others. This is the final option. 
This revelation pertains to Yahweh's throne, the judgment, the scroll, and the rat lamb receiving the book. I think it's everywhere. Everywhere. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 11. Behold, Yahweh has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. You mean he's the ready writer riding on his horse with a seal that he's offering with him? We've come to the point where we must number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom so that we can dwell in the secret place of the Most High and as priests after the order of Melchizedek, we shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This revelation shall deliver his Melchizedek priesthood from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence that comes from Wuhan, China because of that red bloody horse that is then going to box people in and they're going to find themselves with the plague of death. Revelation 19 verifies the events of the first seal. Let's read Revelation 19. And after these things I heard a great voice of many people in the heavens saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power to Yahuwah our Elohim. For true and Zadik, righteous are his judgments. He has judged the great whore who did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the bloods of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four creatures fell down and they worshipped Yahuwah. And they sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise to our Elohim, all of you his servants, and you that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters and the voice of the mighty thundering saying hallelujah the master Yahweh El Shaddai reigns let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen she is clean and white for the fine linen is the zadakar of the saints. The fine linen is the first seal. It's when you exchange the garments of theology, the garments of this world, you accept the invitation, you get the fine linen, and you come into the place of safety so that you do not have to suffer the subsequent apocalyptic horsemen riding out but most will not know their Messiah's offer when he offers it to them because they believe the up is down, the black is white, and that it's the anti-Messiah that rides out with all of their mumbo-jumbo theology based upon two Greek words about a crown of victory and a crown of a king. Give me a break. They wouldn't know their Messiah if he stood before them. Yahuwah is true. Every man a liar and the Lamb of Yahuwah rides forth, offering an invitation to all of us. He said to me, these are the true sayings of Yahuwah, the true sayings of a ready writer, the ready writer who holds scribal pen to scroll. Do you not see? The true saying of Yahweh is to those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, being the first seal that calls us to the marriage supper. That 
is what the true saying of Yahuwah is. And it is supported by Psalm chapter 45. My heart is indicting a good true matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of the ready writer. And Revelation 19 verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See that you do it not. I am your fellow servant, and from your Israelite brothers, who have the testimony of Yahushua, and worship Yahuwah. For the testimony of Yahushua is what? The spirit of prophecy. And I saw the heavens opened, and see a white horse, here's the book ends, and the white horse and he who sat upon it was called what? Faithful and true. Here's your faithful and true saying, and in Zadokah righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a long garment dipped in blood and his name is called the Devar Yahuwah the word of Yahuwah the wedding garment clothes us the wedding garment is what shields us from Yahuwah's judgment during the great tribulation and ushers us under his protective wings to prophesy throughout the great tribulation to those that are outside being judged because of their rejection of the first seal Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 and at that time shall Michael stand up, and the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be, de what time? At that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book the scroll, the invitation that was offered, that went forth. Daniel by prophetic unction here wrote, if we're to be found within the book, written in the book, then we'd see the light that we'd be found in the first seal because it's there within the first seal that Yahushua is revealed. Revelation 6 and Revelation 19 are bookends of the price of accepting or rejecting the proposal found in the first seal. I'll repeat that. It's of primary importance. Revelation 6 and Revelation 19 are bookends of the price of the price of either accepting or rejecting the proposal that is found within the first seal. Hosea chapter 2 verse 18, we'll finish up, that's a lot to lay on you, and then we'll take some questions. <laughs> You're all looking stunned. Hosea 2.18, I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. There is peace. There is peace to us who are truly called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those who have an ear to listen to what the Ruach saith to the final generation. What is up is down. What is black is white. We have to come out of the muddy tire tracks of our mind and look at what the Bible says and listen to the spirit of prophecy. 
because we live in phenomenal times. Let's have a look and see if we have any All right. Always awesome to um, listen to our, our brother Matthew, uh, Nolan, of course, of Tour to the Tribes. Um, but I, I thought it was, you know, very interesting what he was talking about, how, you know, and literally he spent three different teachings on teaching that, you know, Yahusha, not in the flesh, but by the spirit, by the Ruach, um, is the first seal. You know, and that, that literally the, so in Egypt, and we're going to get more into this, you know, next week, more of the details. So you can literally, you'll be able to see it side by side and everything like that. But um, that, you know, it's, it, and like you said, it's by the blood, you know, that we're, we're covered by the blood. So that, you know, during the Exodus, you know, and he said, he referenced, you know, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first right? So during the Exodus, the blood came last, you know, right before that last judgment, right? But for us, by the blood of Yahusha and by keeping his commandments, as he instructed us to do, we are sealed. Because, and if you go back and listen to, um, I think it was actually this teaching. I want to say it was this teaching. If you, it, it's earlier in the teaching. He actually references where Yahusha comes and he marks you with an ink tab, as in you're his, or if you're not his, he'll come and mark you with a blood tab, and that, that's a mark of death, you know, that you're marked for death. So you're either marked from, you're either marked for Yahuwah, for Yahusha, or you're marked for death, you know. Um, but, um, but, you know, in this, this these scriptures, um, it was right before I started listening to his series on the book of Hebrews. So it was probably 14 months ago or so, somewhere around there. And um, the book of Hebrews in three different areas, it, it references the same uh, phrase. Uh, it's Hebrews 3, 7, Hebrews 3, 15, and Hebrews 4, 7. And it says, today, if you hear the sound of the Ruach HaKodesh speaking. Do not harden your hearts as in the days of the rebellion where your fathers tried me in the wilderness, saw my wondrous works. And um, I don't remember the rest of it. I apologize. But go back and look it up. Okay. And also, if, you, if you're reading along in the Torah portions right now, you know, we're going through right now in the Torah portions in the book of Numbers where, you know, they had been trying Yahuwah you know, the last couple of tour portions and, and people were judged in, um, in the areas of where, you know, they weren't, they weren't having belief, right? Because uh, it's by, it's by belief or by faith that we're saved, or sorry, it's by grace that we've been saved through faith, through belief, so that no man can boast, right? And uh, how many times, you know, in Yahushua's ministry, did he reference, you know, it, you know, go son, go thy daughter, your faith, your emunah has made you well, right? Or other times he would go into a village, he would only be able to do a couple of miracles there. We're talking about Yahusha, <laughs> you know, uh, the word made flesh who dwelt among us, the revealed Yahuwah, you know, but he's literally limited by our level of belief because he chooses to partner with his creation instead of doing it on his own. That's what he intended for in Genesis. That's why we titled this. Um, we had the part about that he's declared the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46.10 it references that because he intended for uh, the dominion to be in the hands of Adam, but Adam gave it over to the hands of Satan. So the seed of the woman has to come crush the serpent's head, and he's going to bruise his heel. And he and that's why he said after he after he raised from the dead uh, after the third day, he said, 
all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. <laughs> right? Because he has, he's holding the keys of death, hell, and the grave in his hand. Right? That's why in Revelation chapter 1, that he talks about, I am the one who holds the keys. He's got the keys now. Right? That's why he's worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals. Hallelujah. Right? Anyway, let me not get off on a tangent here. Um, but so last week we talked about the importance of, of uh, watching and waiting and not being weighed down by the things of this world, right? But to, to, but to be watchful, to have our spiritual eyes open. We walk by faith. We walk by emunah and not by sight because if you're walking by sight right now, you're caught up in the strong delusion that the world's caught up in. You know, which is why, and Brother Matthew referenced this last week, you know, people are, are bowing down to stuff that has nothing to do with what it actually has to do with and everything like that. And, uh, you know, my wife and I, we actually have a plaque in our room that uh, says, walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It's the only thing that was good in the Left Behind movie. That's the only thing I, I gleaned from that movie is to walk by faith and not by sight. Everything else is pretty much junk, right? <laughs> but uh, junk and twisted. But that, having spiritual, like if there's one thing I could impart to you real quick, you know, uh, by the spirit of prophecy, is to prophesy over you that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened and that you may know the, the, the spirit, you would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him and that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the glorious inheritance of us, the saints, according to the working of his mighty power. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. That's what I would pray for you if I could pray, if I could pray something over you because if you're not walking with your spiritual eyes opened and enlightened, you will be caught up in the strong delusion that the world's in, all right? Now, the other thing is, so Passover, right? So, um, you know, and, and Brother Jose mentioned Passover in his slides, but again, this is all a ruach because we didn't even talk about, hey, what's in your slides? Hey, what's in your slides? Or whatever. We didn't have that discussion, okay? This is all ruach because, but it, isn't it interesting that if you look at, um, you know, the Passover, right? It talks about the, you know, how do you eat the Passover, right? This is the last thing right before the last judgment, before the death angel comes, right? And wipes out all the firstborn in the land. And that they, they had to take and, and, you know, kill, kill the Passover lamb, put the blood of, you know, on the, on the doorposts, you know, over the doorposts. And, and we, we are covered by that blood, right? We enter in by that blood. But also, how did they eat it? It said they eat it with haste, in haste, with your staff in hand, with your loins girded, and sandals on your feet. you got to be ready to go, is what my message is to you, right? So what's another reference to that? Luke chapter 21, and I referenced this last week as well, but I just want to bring it up again, because I want to have the emphasis on not being weighed down. So Luke 21, 34 through 36, and then I'll get into it. I only have a couple slides, so no words, all right? Literally, I have four. Um, but Luke 21, 34 through 36 says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing or gluttony, uh, gluttony uh, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day, capital D, the day of his return come upon you come on you unexpectedly for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth watch therefore and pray always that you be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the son of man so just like in the passover see they didn't have a whole bunch of belongings that they had and everything like that right he said, how do you eat the Passover? You eat it in haste. You got your sandals on your feet. You got your loins girded and you got a staff in hand and you are ready to go. You are ready to leave Egypt because we got to be ready to leave Egypt. 
We got to be ready to leave mystery Babylon. We got to be ready to leave this world behind and forsake everything for the sake of following him. Leave, count it all as loss for the sake of following him, right? Um, because we can't be weighed down. If we're weighed down by material things or things that we have or things that we're tied to, things that we love in this world over loving him, he says that we're not worthy to be called his disciple. That's why he tells us to weigh the, count the cost before you follow me because it's high. You're going to leave everything behind to follow me. Right now, I'll just give you a brief testimony, but right now in, May, in March, I haven't seen my two little girls, two of my, two of my daughters since March because my calling is, is a watchman to warn people. So I warned out of the kindness and love of my own heart, I warned my ex-wife of the things that are happening right now. And that cost me being called mentally unstable and unsafe and everything like that. And I haven't been able to see my kids, my children since then, because she, she thinks that, um, you know, that I would choose their spiritual well-being over their physical well-being, which is true. Because I would choose my own spiritual well-being over my physical well-being, right? So it's, it's actually true, but it's backwards. What's love is actually hate in this world, and what's hate is actually love, right? But even that, you know, and, and even if he were to take everything away from me, you know, like he, like he allowed to happen to Job, we got to be willing to follow him even in that moment, even if everyone around us disappears, all of our friends, all of our family members, everything else, we've got to be willing to follow him and count it all as loss for the sake of knowing him, because that's all that matters. That's all that matters. And, um, you know, I know that, and, and also right now, you know, his heart is breaking, you know, because he knows that there's a lot of his children that will never come home, you know, and I have the hope that even if I never get to see them on this side again, even though they only live like 20 minutes away, that I will get to be with them forever. I will get to be with them in the new Jerusalem, you know? So anyway, we, we can't be weighed down by the things of this world. We got, that's why I emphasized last week, the importance of watching and waiting. All right. Okay. So uh, any uh, questions or comments, you know, regarding what, uh, what Matthew spoke on real quick? No, but I have a comment about what you said. <laughs> okay. That, that's fair too. <laughs> yeah. That, I just said, just an add on. And, um, and I saw some sisters posting this on yeah. online as well about Matthew 18. Uh, when, you know, we, we lose what we lose on, on earth, we lose on, lose on heaven and, out on earth, we, we found on, on heaven as well. And it is so true because, you know, when we hear, um, when Yahuwah hears our cry or our supplications to the Father, you know, about uh, giving us time with our children or, or, uh, or just give them an opportunity to get to know the Savior, which is more important, right? So they can come to a knowledge of truth and, and they can, um, you know, speedily enter the kingdom as we will enter the kingdom because those are things that we need to focus on Yahushua said don't focus on the things that are perishable things that are everlasting so so when we um when we take this petitions to the father um you know we we are losing them to to abba father so they uh so he can go ahead and take care of them and um and these are things that um for as long as we um you know we keep him in in our in our minds in our hearts and 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 in the spiritual uh, and just give them over to him above. You know, he will take care of these things for us and uh, take care of them as well. So I think um, there's, um, there's uh, uh, you know, things that we can do that are relevant to their salvation. Absolutely. So we just, it takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of, you know, uh, interceding and, uh, yeah. and sometimes counseling, right, when we have a chance to actually speak to them. So we can teach them the right way. So the word and their behavior will never depart from Yahuwah's will, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, one thing I wanted to bring up that uh, Alita said in the chat here, um, that Matthew 18, 18, that Yahushua has given us the keys is also as his bride. And that's actually something we're going to touch on regarding the two witnesses, because he continues to partner with his creation, 
which we are his bride. Absolutely. Amen. And brother Conrad last night, um, had a, a really good commentary about how we have things backwards in our world because, um, you know, because it's the, it's the bride who has to make herself ready. Right. But in our world, the, uh, you know, the, the bridegroom <clears throat> is standing at the altar waiting for her to arrive. But brother Conrad was saying last night that, um, that the bridegroom is the one who would actually enter last. And he is the one who would be clothed in special garments of, you know, uh, precious white and all that stuff. And uh, that the bride would be the one waiting uh, at the altar for the groom. Right. Um, so we just have it, we have it backwards in our culture, but we have to, you know, we have to make ourselves ready as his bride. You know, and that, that's another thing, again, that, you know, Brother Matthew touched on, um, you know, in Revelation 19. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, the, the, the three, four of us that are in the stewardship of this group, we actually have some really, really awesome ideas going forward of, you know, how we're going to tie these things in, not only to calendar, but, you know, the spiritual application and prophetic application of what's happening along with, like as an asset to uh, what, and in addition to what what Brother Matthew is actually teaching as well. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, Miss Brenda from Virginia, how are you doing this morning? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat I'm doing shalom. Great, doing Excellent. great, great. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to um, Jose's teaching about the Takufa because few months ago when I saw a presentation about the Takufa ending and beginning on the same day. I had not seen it. I had not seen that presentation before, but you know, Yah is good and he reveals all things. So as I was listening to Brother Jose, and this is more of a comment and a confirmation for me, but uh, as um, I was have been praying about it and uh, as I was listening to Brother Jose's presentation this morning, Yah revealed how the Takufa the, the, the Takufa ended, okay, on that day. The following day is the beginning of a new cycle. Is that correct? For the uh, sun. Uh, yes, yes. That, that. Yes, uh, that is correct, sister, uh, okay. because the word uh, Shane year, um, meaning the you know cycle revolution of the sun, and uh, and when you see the Takufa, the end of that revolution, uh, happens in a certain point. So uh, Takufa literally means the end of yes. that year. That's that that sick that that circuit of the sun. So yes, the following day would be the new, the beginning of the beginning, right? Because it's a kufa. How how are we going to measure that? Um, how are we going to know when the end of the year is until the actual sun casts no shadow? So we're able to see that, um, you know, at the end of that year. So that it would determine the end of the year, and then the following day would be the uh, the beginning of the new one. Absolutely. Right. So I'm thanking and praising y'all for revealing that clearly to me today, because um, because when I saw that presentation by Daisy and I think Frank was was her husband's name, it, it, it caused me to question. Okay, so if it ended, why? If it ends, then why doesn't it begin? But that's impossible. It can't end and then begin on the same day. Right. That's the way Yah has revealed it to me. So right. I'm just saying um, thank you for the presentation, and I'm praising Yah exceedingly for revealing it to me and making it very clear to me today. So mm -hmm. yes, praise absolutely. Yah for all yeah, things. Absolutely, and it does make a, exactly a 360-day uh, rotation, and so that's 360th day is when the Takufa happens, and then the following day would be the first day. Yeah. Right. And it starts its cycle again. Yes, Great. yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. Brother Jose, did you touch on that? I know you did last night, um, but did you touch on that one slide where you had the pyramids up and you actually said that on the Takufa, like on that concave part, like you would have the shadow on one half of it and then the light on the other half? That's right, yes. Uh, there is that, uh, during the Takufa, uh, the, um, there, it, there, the angle of the pyramid and one of the four sides is concave, so it it actually is uh, like you know two smaller pyramids in one pyramid. So what happens at the sun when it hits reflects off the limestone during the takufa, it it lights up one of the sides, and the other one side is dark and the other side is light. So it's kind of like saying the old the darkness or the the end of the last year is over and the new beginning of the new year starts and you can actually go online and uh, there is somebody that actually did and took some uh, pictures above the pyramids and did a um, investigated on the day of Takufa what happened to the reflection of the light and back in 1932 and I'm sure to sure that and I believe it was 1932 um, and I'm sure there's been many um, you know expositions or experiments done in in the Giza pyramids um, to know what they were used for but um, it was by no shadow of a doubt there were definitely huge time keeping pieces uh, that were designed for that and for seasons um, and um, there was something that I wanted to also um, uh, share is um, um, Anyway, there, there, there was, there, there are some really good information in regards to, to that. There is also um, the way the shadow is casted, on the Takufa, which is very, very interesting. If you and and one day um, I may even talk to Conrad, and maybe he can share this on the on next week. Uh, but what happens during the Takufa is that the shadow, not just one, but two pyramids, okay, their shadow casts directly over the Sphinx during the Takufa. I mean, pointing right at it, not overshadowing the Sphinx, but pointing it at it, kind of like, a, like an arrow, looking right at it. And it's an exactly straight line. I mean, it's almost done perfectly on this day of the year. And so it, it, there's just like this, um, this, this uh, well, I guess this would be symbolic to them, but the shadow itself pointed right at the Sphinx. And it's funny how the, the sun rises right over the Sphinx head and, uh, and he also alludes to this, the Sphinx. We have to understand that, um, that the wisdom that um, Moshe got from the Egyptians, um, it was, the Egyptians, you know, of course, had a lot of wisdom. But we have to know that the pharaoh that actually put uh, Moshe in charge as a second in command of all of Egypt, he was a Shemite. So a lot of the information that these, uh, you know, builders, and uh, these uh, pharaohs and kings got, they were already passed on from Yahuwah, you know, before the flood. So they were very knowledgeable about these things. And, um, and also remember that he also did uh, take the counsel of Yahuwah, knowing that he was the Elohim. So there, there, is, um, there is evidence that, um, you know, a lot of these, um, uh, you know, uh, if we recall, you know, a lot of this wisdom and a lot how these things were constructed, you know, came from the wisdom of also uh, Shem, you know. So, um, you know, so we know that is through the Melchizedek uh, line, right? I mean, I mean. Um, Joy, you have your hand up? Anybody see them? Can you see them, Jose? Uh, Al Alcatel Joy. Uh, I I can see um, Joy. Go ahead. Alcatel, you're trying to speak. Uh, you want to want to unmute your mic if you're trying to speak. And it's not letting me unmute either. Well, I can try unmute. I'm trying, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's going on? Oh. No, it took it down. Okay. Yeah. Yep. There we go. There we go. Go ahead. Yeah, the... 
Uh, Joel, we cannot we cannot hear you. It's very uh, very staticky, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I apologize. If you if you put like a question or something in the chat, uh, maybe we can communicate that way. But it's got a bad connection. I apologize. All right. So uh, so we're gonna get to to my slides now, um, which like I said, I just have a handful. Um, and then um, and then next week we'll go into into greater detail here. All right. So. Oh, hello, Brandon. Yeah. Rob, I didn't know that I was showing up as Alcatel. Can you hear me now or is it still a oh, problem? It's better. It's better. Is this Miss Brenda? Yes, it is. I'm on yeah. my tablet again. I guess I, I forgot that this tablet doesn't allow me to do that very well. I'll oh, okay. Something about um, Daisy's presentation. Brenda brought it up. This is something that was in my mind from Daisy's presentation. If I correctly, she indicated several different uh, uh, sundowns to uh, track when the shadow did not exist. And I think she said that they could track the shadow a day or two before the time it was listed as And so they started counting their holy days based upon that. And I think they were like maybe like two days ahead of us. So I was curious about that as to whether or not the day that it is measured with the sundowns is the same as the, the Kufa day published by NASA or whoever does it. And I was also curious as to which day the shadow on the pyramid um, will be um, marked with the Kufa versus what's recorded that we're using like with Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, do me a favor and just shoot me an email um, with your question. And then um, Brother Conrad's going to actually get into more of the Takufa next week as well. And then, uh, and then we can address it uh, then. Does that sound good? And also, Brenda, because I, I, I could understand just a few things that were coming yeah. in. You were coming in and out, so I heard a few words, and, but I missed a few. But I heard something about the sundial and the pyramid and the one that's going to happen in NASA. Right. So, but if you can, uh, yeah, if you can uh, write it down like Brandon said, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to address those questions next week because we're going to continue on the Takufa next week. Yep. 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 Thank you, sister. All right. So let me uh, share my screen here. All right, can you guys now see where it says the two witnesses? I lost, uh, there we go. All right. Yes. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, you know, just kind of continuing here what, um, you know, Brother Matthew uh, has been talking on for the last couple of weeks regarding the two witnesses. Um, and um, we're not going to deviate anything from what he's already, you know, taught us regarding, you know, he touched on like, you know, potentially John being one, uh, gave pretty, uh, pretty solid evidence um, uh, two weeks ago uh, of Elijah. And, um, you know, Brother Jose touched on some of the stuff that Elijah did and everything. And then, um, you know, last week he touched on the two witnesses actually being uh, represented by, the, you know, the two olive trees which are represented here and also the two lampstands which are represented here. So I just don't want you to, con I don't want to confuse you because there's a couple of these pictures just because they look cool that I used, you know, two guys represented or two men represented, but we're definitely not saying that it's only two men. Okay. You know, and also, um, you know, we know that this is from Ezekiel 37, you know, 16 through 17. You know, it says, moreover, son of man, take, take one stick and write upon it for Yehuda and for the children of Israel and his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph and the stick of Ephraim, Ephraim um, for all the house of Israel and his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. Ezekiel 37 16 through 17, right? So Judah, Ephraim, the two houses becoming 
the house of Israel. And, you know, what is the, what is the thing that, you know, Yehu, or that the disciples said to Yahusha right after his resurrection, right? In verse seven of Acts chapter one, they said, um, or sorry, uh, verse six, you know, so that, so when they had come together, they asked him saying, master, would you at this time restore the reign or the kingdom to Israel? Would you restore the houses? Because that's what he's going to do, right? And actually, if you look at our our tour portion this week, you know, um, where uh, I think it was in number 17 or it might have been 18, but pretty sure it was number 17, but where, you know, Moshe takes all these staffs, all these sticks from representative of the different tribes in different houses or not different houses, different tribes and then also in addition to that from the Aaronic priesthood they had Levi's in there as well right and you know Levi's in in the tent you know his ended up budding you know a couple of times and also bringing forth almonds and everything like that so the priesthood not the Levitical priest not the Aaronic priesthood but the the greater priesthood you know the Melchizedek you know, king of righteousness priesthood is what is going to bring us all together into one house, right? Hallelujah. So that's what this represents. So the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two lampstands, you know, uh, Brother Matthew, you know, gave several references last week, but just a few, Revelation chapter 11, Zechariah 4, and again, uh, Ezekiel 37, right? So what are we going to be doing during the tribulation now and i had actually wrote this before i actually found i told brother jose i was looking for that piece on uh, revelation 6b that i that, that i ended up finding but i forgot that he even talked about that we would be prophesying and what we would be doing during the tribulation right so again that's just how the rule works so <laughs> brings everything together so we're, we're being empowered to walk in power. Hallelujah. Right? That's why we did, you know, three weeks ago, I believe it was, where we touched on the different manifestations of the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh and how we can't set that aside and we can't put, we can't quench it. We have to, you know, embrace it and walk in the giftings that we have. Right? Um, so what did, you know, what did Yahusha have to say? about all this, right? And then if you guys would, just remember to please mute your mics. Um, so I'm hearing a little bit of background noise here. All right, I found it. All right. Um, so, you know, Yahusha said that we would do greater works than these, which that's a pretty <laughs> astounding statement considering what he did right? Which I don't even have that list, but, you know, we know that he made the, the lame walk. He made the blind see. He made the deaf hear. He made the mute speak. He cast out devils and demons. Um, you know, he raised the dead. He did all these things. He cleansed the leper. You know, he did all of these things, right? But in John chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, it says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these he shall do, because I go to my Father. And it says, whatever you ask in my name, that I shall do in order that the Father might be esteemed in the Son, or in order that the Father might be glorified in the Son. If you ask what are, whatever in my name, I shall do it. Hallelujah. Right? And then Acts chapter 1 Later on in two verses later than where we just were, it says, but you shall receive power when the set-apart spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Yerushalayim, in Yehuda, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? So we're going to read about um, and talk about just some of the details about what the two witnesses will do, and also the, the time frame of... Last night I said timeline, but I meant to say time frame. The time frame of when the two witnesses will be on the earth. Because there's two different, um, there's two different theories. Okay, there's a theory 
Well, number one, there's a theory of a, a seven year tribulation, right? Versus, you know, and brother uh, Jose, Conrad and Johnny and myself, you know, um, and of course, you know, being led by the spirit, uh, but we would just looked at, you know, hey, is there, is there any references that we can even find for evidence of the seven year tribulation? Because all we could find was 40, the 42 months that are mentioned. And we found about 15 or 17 different references um, to that, you know, which we're going to get into in just a second, you know, from, from uh, Elijah, which uh, Brother Jose touched on last week. You know, of course, the book of Daniel, of course, the book of, uh, of Revelation as well in several chapters, you know, Revelation 11, 12 and 13 all mention uh, 42 months, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, all mention 42 months as well, right? Um, so that's the, uh, that's the whole point. What are, you know, so the first theory uh, is that the two witnesses are raised up and given a ministry to, to prophesy their 1,200 in, or the 1,260 days or 1,260 days, right? And, um, and then they are, they meet, you know, the, the beast comes out, uh, fights with them, overcomes them and kills them. And then the three and a half days that they are dead in the streets, that they lay dead in the streets are a prophetic three and a half days. And then it's actually three and a half years. That's the first theory. The second theory, which is the one that I've adopted. And I believe that brother Matthew, based upon this uh, teaching that we just watched, because he just referenced that we're going to be prophesying throughout the great tribulation, okay, is that they are raised to power, or, or not raised to power, but uh, raised up, right, and uh, built up for, you know, like Esther says, for such a time as this, right, um, as a countermeasure to the beast, then the false prophet, and the beast system. So it's literally a counter, it's, it's Yahuwah's counterattack. And also, we're going to get into more of this detail-wise, but I'll give you a kind of a, a glimpse of next week as well, because I, I submit to you that Aharon and Moshe in the book of Exodus, if you go back, and actually I would give you some homework for this week, um, is to read Exodus chapter 7 or Shemot chapter 7 through Shemot chapter 10 and look at what happened. Because, again, that's why we titled this, that about declaring the end from the beginning, because there's nothing new under the sun. That which has been also shall be, right? Ecclesiastes 1.9 speaks of. So through Moshe and Aharon, they are a shadow picture, a prophetic shadow picture or forerunner, if you will, of the two witnesses. Now, again, I'm not saying that these two men represent two men, we, we believe that, you know, it's two bodies. It's the, it's the two houses of Israel coming together, the two lampstands, the two olive trees, as Ma Brother Matthew mentioned last week. But the point is, is that Yahuwah, see, Yahuwah could have poured out all those plagues upon Egypt, you know, just by himself if he wanted to, right? But he chooses, again, to partner with his creation. He chooses to partner with creation. So he used... Aharon and Moshe to do it, and he will do it again through uh, the two houses, through the priesthood, right? So, so I submit to you theory B, or, you know, second theory, is that these are raised up, and their 42 months are the same 42 months time frame, or 1260 days, that the beast and the false prophet are uh, given their power as well and their authority as well okay and we're going to get into this all right so as you can see here so revelation and, and you know please follow along and um you know test everything that i say don't take my word for it you know if you can't see it in your own scripture with your own eyes then you know believe what it says don't take my opinion okay so uh but revelation chapter 11 verse 3 it says and i will give my power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth and these are the two olive trees the two lampstands standing before the elohim of the earth and if anyone wants to harm them fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies 
And if anyone wants to, wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls on the falls in the days of their prophesy, prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Now, real quick, we're going to skip ahead uh, two slides here because I want to talk about Elisha. You know, Brother Jose touched on Elijah last week, but I just wanted to touch on a couple more things. So, because um, this 1260 days, and, and Brother Matthew two weeks ago, you know, he he gave us really solid evidence of Elijah possibly being uh, associated with the two witnesses as well. But, you know, it's mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, and um, the four of us in one of our brainstorming sessions actually found these verses all together. But it says, and Eliyahu, which is Elijah's real name, the Tishbite in the, of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as Yahuwah Elohim of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain these years except at my word. And, and, then, and then a whole chapter later, verse uh, chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And after many days it came to be that the word of Yahuwah came to Eliyahu in the third year, saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I give rain on the earth. Now, so initially, we don't even know how long he, this span was for. But now in, Rebel, in the second verse that we have, now we see it's at least three years later, right? Because it's in the third year. So then we actually found two other references. And this really drives it home as to when this is, or, when, or how long it is, rather. James chapter 5, verse 17 Eliyahu was a man with feelings like us, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Now, we know that every truth has to be established by two or three witnesses, right? So th that's one witness. So the second witness is Yahusha, and it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 25, but truly I say to you that, uh, say to you, many widows were in Israel in the days of Eliyahu when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months and there was a great scarcity of food in all the land. And Eliyahu was sent to none of them but to Seraphath of Sidon to a woman and a widow. So we can see here clearly that Elijah has a set time where there was drought for three and a half years. Okay, or 42 months, right, or 1260 days. It's all tied in. And the importance of this, and that this is why we're touching on, you know, the calendar and then also the spiritual and prophetic as well, because this doesn't work. These timelines don't work unless you have a 30 day calendar. You have to have a 30 day month, you know, the 30 day, the 30 dawn lights, as Conrad so refers to it as, right? So, these are the two olive trees, the two lampstands, standing before the Elohim of the earth. Fire comes out of their mouth and consumes their enemies, right? We know that uh, Elijah or Eliyahu called fire down from heaven as well, right? They possess authority, right? They possess authority to uh, shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. Uh, they have power over the waters to strike them with blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they wish. So by the spirit, the bride comes in into unity and is empowered by the spirit to be in tune with the spirit as to what we are supposed to be praying for here. Because just like Brother Jose referenced to, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, right? And is what's happening on earth is happening in heaven. So we, we're partnering with it. That's why, you know, a few months ago, uh, before all this started, you know, I believe that we were in the, you know, like in the winter months, we were in the time frame of, you know, declaring that Yahusha was worthy to take that scroll and to open its seals. And as his bride, we come into agreement with him. And we say, we trust you, Yahusha. We want you to come back. 
you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals like Revelation chapter 5 talks about, right? So, um, and then in verse 7, it says, and, and at the end of their witness, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our master was impaled. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So, so again, we see, and, and I think this gives further evidence to that, that time frame that they're there, because if they were there in the, in the part, in, in the theory A, then they wouldn't have been tormenting the beast and the beast system in, in, in Babylon, right? They wouldn't have been doing that. But it's as, it's as you know, uh, the authority has been given to the beast and the beast system that these are called up as a countermeasure. The two houses are called up as a countermeasure to prophesy and to have the authority to shut heaven so there's no rain, to turn water into blood, which we're going to get into all the details of this next week. This is just kind of a, a teaser, if you will, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they wish. So they're given the authority. That's the big point here. What are we? We're not helpless in the midst of the tribulation. That's the point. Okay. Um, and there's a place of safety. Our place of safety is in the wilderness. Their place of safety back in the Exodus was in Goshen. And again, we're going to get into that next week. And then it says, now after three and a half days, the breath of life from Elohim entered into them. And they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. And in that same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the, tenth of the city fell. And in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the Elohim of heaven. All right. So that's what's going to be going on is that these two houses are raised up as a prophetic countermeasure to because so if you remember um, in the Revel when we first started the Revelation chapter six uh, series that Matthew did where he did like five parts on it right where um, he touched on um, hang on let me get my thoughts real quick oh he touched on the the through the demonic technology of like harp and do and all these other weaponry that they have you know that these fall this fallen angel technology has has been given to uh to these wicked men um you know that they had been making it feel like on the earth that the tribulation had already started through their demonic technology you know and that was a curveball when i heard matthew talk about that because i was actually one of those who was under the impression of that, you know, and I was actually trying to figure out, well, where are we at, you know, in the midst of the tribulation and everything like that, especially when, you know, three years ago, we see the Revelation 12 sign, and I'm like, wait a minute, why are we seeing the Revelation 12 sign <laughs> when, you know, um, when we're not, we haven't even, feels like we haven't even seen a seal judgment yet, you know, um, but, you know, and then I remember hearing the Ruach say, Braxton Hicks, because see, before the birth pains start, before the uh, beginning of sorrow start, before labor starts, even the first thing you have in most cases. Now I've seen three uh, beautiful little girls be born, so I've I've been through this experience three times. Well, not myself, but I've witnessed it. But Braxton Hicks, that false labor pain is comes first. And that's what Brother Matthew was referring to. I believe it's in Revelation 6a, if you go back and, and watch it or listen to it or look up the notes. Okay, but the point is, is that we will be raised up as uh, a light to, a prophetic light to the world 
and uh, we will also be like assassins where we'll not, not killing people. Let me, let me rephrase that more like spies, you know, which is another reference that brother Matthew referenced, you know, in regards to uh, Joshua uh, better known as Yahusha and Caleb uh, who are from the tribes of Ephraim and Yehuda. You know, that's one of the first things I picked up on last week when I was reading that tour portion. I'm like, wait a minute, these two spies that were good, they're from Ephraim and Yehuda. How about that? You know, but we will be spies where we'll kind of go into, you know, out into the world and pluck people out and pull them in, you know, into the place of safety. You know, so I just want you to know that we're not going to be just helpless. Okay, we're going to be raised up just like Esther was for such a time as this. And the spirit's going to be poured out on us uh, to where uh, where we're going to be unified and we're going to be a very, very uh, powerful asset in the hand of Yahusha, the Melchizedek high priest. All right. So um, I pray that that was uh, edifying for you. Um, let's see here. All right. I think I ended the share screen there. So excellent. So any, uh, any questions, comments, insights? I have a question. Yeah. I haven't looked this up yet, but I'm, yeah. I'm, eating, I'm eating breakfast and having, <laughs> That's okay. having a good time listening to this teaching. Um, Ephraim, was Israel's name bestowed upon Ephraim or Ephraim's brother? Uh, Ephraim, yes, um, or Ephraim, however you want to say it. Um, yes, because remember when, um, I think it was Jacob who did the blessing. I want to, yeah. you know, when yeah. Israel did the blessing, right? He crossed the hands, even though Manasseh was the oldest, right. um, he crossed the hands to where he, he actually blessed uh, Ephraim and, and uh, yes, so yes. And uh, also, um, again, uh, referring back to Brother Matthew, he touches on that. I don't know which one it is. I know it's in, okay. I'm I'm reading it right now. Yeah, it's in Genesis 49. I All want right, to say. and I'm reading it from. If you don't mind, I'll read oh, it from. Uh, this is called the Word of Yahweh book. Okay. And it is Genesis um, 48. Oh, 48. Okay. Verse, I guess I'll start at verse um, 8. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons, whom Elohim hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, Elohim hath showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, Elohim, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the Elohim which fed me all my life, long unto this day. The angel which redeemed me from all evil blessed the lads 
and let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, he dis it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put your right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, in thee shall Israel bless, saying, Elohim, make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but Elohim shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Okay, yep. so yeah, so he blessed uh, Ephraim mm -hmm. and the two sticks, Ephraim and Judah. Yes. All right, and I'm I'm just trying to get to a point here where they will become Ephraim and Judah are going to become one stick, which is going to be Israel. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep, that's uh, that's testified. Uh, definitely in Ezekiel 37, among other places, but yeah, it's definitely testified there for sure. So yeah, and and also the name um, Israel, you know, it belongs to Joseph. It belongs to to Ephraim and Manasseh. It doesn't belong to Judah. You know, they never got the the rights to the name or the land, but the the rights to the name and the land come from that, just like what you said right there. Um, so, from this blessing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it's, they, it's further details of it are in the 49th chapter as well. So it's, it's pretty awesome. What were we going to say? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, nothing. Okay. I, I, I was I thinking, but I, I've got it. I've got it. Thank okay. you. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Thank awesome. You. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to add to that that um, and I was discussing this with my with um, brother Conrad about this and uh, if it wasn't for the division of the kingdoms and Ephraim and Manasseh, you know, taking along the ten tribes with him and and going out into the Gentile nations, how would Abraham's promise be fulfilled? <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that they ended up sinning, so Yahuwah took that sinful, you know, when they were worshiping, you know. Um, you know, when they were, you know, committing idolatry and all that, they were sent out to other nations. And, and so um, they intermingled with the Gentiles. So how else would that bit of that prophecy would have been accomplished if it wasn't for the sin they committed, but Yahuwah did it for a greater good. He, he put them out in the nations. Now that he's bringing them back to himself, you know, so Abraham can become the father of all nations. So it's quite interesting how Yahuwah uses um, evil for good, you know? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, Brenda from Jacksonville has a question, uh, well, comment and a question. So it says, uh, two bodies in the street seems like two humans to me, or how and when does the, the whole world rejoice when the two witnesses die? When did, or will they die? Uh, and, and you, and when, did or will they come back to life in the dark ages when the body was in hiding during the crusades and other persecutions? So great question, great comment. Um, so my understanding of it is that, you know, and also, so we know that, you know, and, and brother Matthew agrees with us as well that, you know, that Jerusalem, you know, what we know of Jerusalem now is that's mystery Babylon, you know, in places like, the United States, uh, Mecca, Rome, other places as well, because there's seven daughters of Babylon, 
of the great harlot. So there's a great harlot and then she has seven daughters, right? But all of the streets of, you know, the world, because they're all going to be under the control of Mystery Babylon and under the beast system, you know, and under the beast, right? So, um, you know, there will be a, my, my interpretation of it, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm open to, you know, further discussion and everything like that. And I never think that I have it all figured out because that's when we fall, right? But my interpretation of it is that, you know, the two witnesses represent the two houses, right? And that uh, those two houses, um, you know, I, I think that they also represent the 144,000 because we know that the 144,000 represents all 12 tribes, you know, 12,000 for each tribe, and that the two witnesses, the two bodies of Ephraim and Yehuda represent the entirety of Israel, right? The two houses becoming one Israel, so therefore all 12 tribes will be included. But so the streets, you know, where it says that the street, that they will lay dead in the streets for three and a half days, um, that those streets could be, you know, anywhere within the kingdom of mystery Babylon. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one geographic place. Although, you know, one thing we were discussing last night is, you know, what if they round up all of us and put us into one, you know, like FEMA region, you know, and that's, that's, uh, you know, where Yahushua comes and our angels come and, you know, take us to the place of the wilderness and stuff like that. You know, we were talking about being, uh, uh, being uh, teleported or whatever, whatever the word is, um, you know, like, uh, like Elijah was, like Philip was and stuff like that. But as far as um, translated, really translated, is it translated? I thought it was okay. We'll go with that. I thought translated was just having to do with languages, but um, okay, we'll go with that. Um, but so in regards to the more of the historic uh, questions and views there regarding like, you know, when did they die? I don't believe that in, in my view of it, and I think that Matthew would agree with this view as well, is I don't believe that they've been raised up yet because I see it as Ephraim and Yehuda coming together. We know that Ephraim was under, uh, under judgment for their wickedness. Uh, I think we discussed it last night. It was like 2,520 years, we said in the chat last night. Um, so, you know, within the past like 10 years, Ephraim has been awakening from the slumber, you know, uh, just as Ezekiel 37, you know, when, when um, Yahuwah told Ezekiel, prophesy, son of man. You know, which I love that. I love that uh, that chapter there. But um, you know, so the awakening's been happening. You know, the, uh, Ephraim's been waking up. So I don't think that they've that they've already lived and already died and everything like that. But I think it's more of a futuristic uh, event, not not like distant future, like you know, relatively uh, relatively soon. But um, and I'm going to have to download this chat because there's some good questions in here that I'll, that I'll have to kind of research and get, get more into, but I haven't checked that one as well. So let's see. Does that answer your question though, Ms. Brenda? Uh, what about the, yeah, no, so great question. The whole world rejoicing and seeing it. So with the technology that we have today, I mean, literally, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, people nowadays are more concerned with streaming and getting likes and, and the attention of, you know, hey, guys, look at this. I can't believe I'm seeing this. Instead of putting their phone in their pocket and, like, pulling someone off of someone, you know, while they're being, you know, beaten or whatever. Um, but so the whole world seeing it, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I think there's going to be, you know, I think the technology already exists that, um, that the whole world would be able to see it. And through, um, you know, through the 5G technology, I think that it's going to be even more so, you know, um, where who knows, they could even use Project Bluebeam and, and like, you know, put it up, you know, kind of like in the movie The Hunger Games where they, you know, project, you um, you know, the, uh, the people who have died in that session of the Hunger Games um, up on the, on the dome that's there. Um, so, yeah, that's what, uh, 
that's what I that's what I see from it. What do you think, Brother Jose? And then we'll get to Brooks' question as well. Sorry, I was trying to answer the question. You're talking about the dawn? Uh, well, it was uh, it was uh, what about the whole world? You know, seeing it and rejoicing. Yeah, I mean the trees, the the plants, um, you know, everything is going to rejoice, you know, and um, and we see, um, you know, we. Oh, I'm talking about when the when the when the witnesses are slain. I'm not talking about like giving oh. glory to Elohim. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, oh, uh, that oh that I'm sorry. Yeah, um, so I was trying to like answer a question online. I was trying to listen at the same time. Yeah, I was no, actually, mm -hmm, I was actually, um, yeah, wondering that myself. I mean, when the world is rejoicing, is because. Uh, and those who are rejoicing are the ones who um, are living wickedly. And yeah. uh, when that light or that fire that the witnesses were putting out by the word of Yahuwah who, that was exposing their evil deeds are not, not being exposed anymore. So they're, they're happy to the way they, they used to be. Yeah. And, and so there are many that, you know, not even through the miracles and the wonders that they, that they caused are even convinced, right? I mean, that, that goes back to, um, you know, you know, Lazarus being raised from the dead. You know, how, mm -hmm. if you don't even believe in the words of Moshe, how, how, how would you even believe that somebody can raise them from, from the dead? Why would you yeah. even believe that, you know? So, um, so I think it's that. I, I, I truly believe that um, the, the, um, those who are happy um, don't love justice, don't love the word of Yahuwah, uh, because it exposes their evil deeds. And, uh, and people are willing to kill yeah. or, you know, for, uh, before their, their uh, wickedness is exposed. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah that's, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty telling as far as, uh, as far as them being, I mean, we're talking about a vision also, which is very symbolic, right? So the, the two witnesses or the two house, tr the uh, two trees, you know, being the olive trees um, and the two people, two men. Uh, do represent the the you know the two houses as well uh, as having the true testimony of Yahuwah and Yahusha yeah. and keeping his commandments you yeah. know yeah. and yeah so and as far as fire coming out of their mouth I think we did discuss that too so that that is uh, what Yahusha I can't remember I don't know it's Revelation 19 I believe but when Yahusha speaks the sword out of his mouth, it's like fire coming out of his yeah. mouth. Yeah. Right? Also, Second so. Thessalonians two talks about that he will consume the the man of perdition with the fire, with the breath of his mouth. With the so. breath of his mouth, so that's like the ruach coming out, yeah. and the word is like a it's like a, a double edged sword, and it's like a two edged sword that that divides the the bones and marrows and and the yeah. source of the heart. So um, just his word alone. See, Yahuwah doesn't need an army of 10, 20, 30,000. He can use an army of just a small group of people. Or mm -hmm. as long as they speak the truth, you know, he, he can cause havoc into the world, you know. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's get to these couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. Jump Absolutely. off here to give uh, Shabbat fellowship. Uh, Brooke, or Mark and Brooke, rather. Hello. Um, hey. Thank you for these topics. Yeah. They're, they're really edifying and really interesting. And awesome. Just awesome. That's what we wanted. Studies and things like that and hearing everybody's opinions and insights and things like that um had a question i you know i don't know how well known he is yet um but have you heard of the joseph gregory hallett person yeah, i have i have um, yeah, so i figured you probably had and yeah. wondered if you had thoughts on how he may play into some of this end time prophecy so Great question. Um, I'm going to be brief, but I, I, I actually need to research this more this week uh, while I still have the time to do so. Because, yeah, I, I definitely want to, you know, try and – and I here's the thing right now is that I believe that the kingdom of darkness right now is throwing up a lot of decoys, okay? You know, because they're trying – he's trying to hide what his move is. Like, hey, look over here. Hey, look over here. Oh, no, it's over here. You know, so he's throwing up a lot of decoys right now, you know, between, you know, people are look. I mean, my, my list keeps growing and growing and growing of people to watch, you know, from Trump to Kushner to Obama to, uh, to Macron, you know, uh, the French president uh, to uh, 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 
to Nimrod himself coming back. Uh, now this Joseph Hallett guy, um, everything like that, right? So lots of different stuff going on. But as far as Joseph Hallett himself, so he could be um, tied to the Messiah, right? He could be. I don't know. Uh, but he also could be, we know that there are going to be, so these, these, uh, these nations as they sit right now, these sovereign nations as they sit right now, the UN will have, and they already have, they've already got the plans for it. The maps already exist of how they're going to divide the entire world into 10 tracts of land, which are going to represent the 10 toes and the 10 kings of, of the earth right? And the 10 crowns that are upon the beast. Okay. And we'll, you know, we'll get more into this later on. I don't want to go too far ahead, but anyway, the point is, is that he could be one of these 10 Kings that are raised up, you know, like maybe he's the King over Europe or something like that, but also he could just be, you know, it, so, you know, it says in Matthew 24 that, uh, just real quick, I'll go there for a brief second and then, uh, and then we'll move on. But it says that, Many will come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah. Well, in these documents that he's been producing and stuff like that, you know, he's literally declaring that he's the Christ, you know, so it could be associated with that as well. So we definitely want to be on guard. You know, we don't want to be caught off guard because one of the things that's happening right now is the duality of Satan's kingdom is prevalent because the lighter side or what appears as light known as the what's known as the Alliance is trying to overtake the dark cabal right now to appear as heroes when they're really not as part of the grand deception. So you got to be weary of all angles. Uh, Cause uh, you know, he's, he's definitely trying to do all that. So, um, so does that answer your question, Brooke? I hope I did. Yes. Thank you. And there's, I don't know, have you seen, there's like an hour and 45 minute interview of him on YouTube. Um, it's kind of interesting what he's claiming. I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't seen that. I have seen the claims though, regarding how he has the, the uh, bloodline rights, Royal bloodline rights to right. the kingdom. And I, I did see that the seals have been removed from the gate and that his seals been placed right. there and all that stuff. So there's a lot of activity there. I just, uh, Ever since I got it so wrong 12 years ago with Obama, I don't make big, bold claims like that. I just don't do it. So I learned yeah, my lesson. I think it's, yeah, it's probably a little early, you know, yeah, in, the, yeah. in the timeline of everything to really say anything concretely. But definitely, I agree. He's one to watch. So and another one, I'm, another one I'm watching is Bill Gates. I mean, I've, I forgot about Bill Gates, but I mean, you know, he's all about Absolutely. this, you know, uh, we, it's kind of interesting that it seems in, you know, the way it looks is that the mark is being revealed before the animus side is being revealed. That's kind of interesting, right? So, and then real quick, uh, Miss Tracy, go ahead. Glad to have you today. Shabbat shalom, brothers and sisters. Shabbat shalom. Um, so I was just going to comment real quickly back with regard to what you were saying with the seeing. Um, Chuck Missler agrees with you with regard to that. He calls that a technology statement, referring to the day in which we'll see these things come to pass. Because yes, certainly in this day and age, those things will be possible to be seen everywhere, broadcast, if you will, all over the place. So I just wanted to confirm that. Yeah, that's what he says too. Amen. Amen. Yes. I, I, um, I have a question. Has, has Chuck um, Missler passed away? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. All right. I, I thought I thought so. Thought I'd seen that somewhere. Okay. Well, in a way, he's still with us. His teachings, yeah, um, they they're sort of rambling to me, but yeah, he's uh, he's out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got he's got some good stuff. So yeah. he he looks up things because he uh, I think he has. Um, I was thinking uh, he's got a degree in what is it, some engineering or something. It's very mechanical when it comes to, you know, interpretation uh, and, and very orderly in the way he does it. Um, I don't mean, I don't agree with him in his theology, but he has really some good findings, especially he broke down the, um, the names and their, and their meanings. And it really told you the whole gospel in the first, uh, uh, from Adam to, to Noah. 
Which yeah. which names? Yeah. Which names? The names. The the generations. The generations. You know, like like Adam, okay. Seth, Methuselah, so on and so forth. But yeah. Yeah, you can look it up online. It's it's very interesting uh, how the Gospel of Yahusha yeah, is actually and I will uh, say, spoken. I don't I don't actually don't know him super well, but I have listened to a few of his teachings and um, the couple of things that I did I thought were very. Um, very thought provoking. So yeah. And, and uh, there's one on the Mazara. Yeah. I know he does some, some yeah, there is one. I haven't seen that, but I have. Uh, I mean, I haven't listened to it, but I have seen it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, what I did as well, just so everybody knows, because I didn't get to every question. So what I did is I downloaded the chat um, for this. Uh, so, uh, or if not, I'll just go back and watch the video once it's available and I'll, I'll get the questions from it. But um, uh, that way I can, you know, we can study or, or, you know, do some research on some of these questions as well and, and give you a better answer uh, next week as well. So just for time's sake. Okay. Yeah, and, and yeah, and, um, and also uh, we do need to give the room here uh, to yeah. Shabbat Fellowship. So if somebody would like to close, out, close us out on prayer. I uh, think Brother Conrad should. I want to hear him pray. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, priest. Okay, Father right, in heaven. Brother. I do recognize that the 144,000 that the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. But what you have concealed, you will reveal. Ooh. And Dan is hidden among the tribes. He is with, no doubt, with Ephraim and Manasseh the Levites, or Issachar. But he is there because you have to have 12. You can't have 13 tribes. You must have 12 tribes. And so you hit Dan among the 144,000 in Revelation. Oh, Father, you are so wonderful. You are so unique. You are above everything. And we love you. And we love you, and we love you, Father in heaven, and with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might, and with all our strength. And everything goes back to you, because we come from you, and we will return back to you, and we will sin no more, just like you. Amen. And we give you thanks in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Father, um, Father in heaven, oh, go ahead. Uh, blessed be your name. Uh, yes. Let your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, for we have forgiven our trespassers. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, power, and glory. All of this in Yahushua's name. Amen. 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 Real quick uh, promo. So if you guys would, you know, help us to get the word out. And especially we removed the password from the Zoom because we were having issues with that for a couple of weeks. And it was difficult for people to get in. So if you know people who were in this calendar club before, which now we're calling it the Melky Zedek uh, calendar club. Um, but if you would, you know, please, you know, please invite them, let them know, hey, man, we're not just talking about just the calendar anymore. We're talking about spiritual principles and prophetic and how we can apply it to the very days that we're living in. So, you know, they, it just, uh, we just want to get the word out to as many people as we can and, and even and new people as well. You know, please just help us uh, to get the word out. All right. Mm -hmm.